to our guests, speakers from different engineering sectors, to our teachers, and for our participants. Welcome for today's seminar entitled Climate Change Factors in Infrastructure Asset Management, the New Zealand Experience, and the Philippine Context. So to formally start our program, may I request everyone to please rise. And as Elena Ledemle will lead us in opening prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have added unto our lives. We thank you, God, for bringing us all together here. We thank you for the College of Engineering and College of Agriculture, as well as, Lord, for our guest speakers for today and for all the teachers who are with us. We ask, Lord, that you may you bless us with the wisdom and the knowledge that we need for this morning, God. And may it be that everything we learn, Lord, will truly be put into practice. Be with us, O oh God, guide us, and continually bless us. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. You may now take your seats. And at this moment, to recognize and acknowledge our today's participants and to introduce our guest speakers, may I call in the Dean of the College or the Department of Civil Engineering. We have Engineer Daryl Mary Earl Grillo. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, good morning, everyone. So it is indeed a good day, um, a good way to start our year. Um, let me first recognize the participants before I introduce our speakers. So um, if I call on your sector, can you please stand and be recognized? So I am um, from outside of CPU. So we have... Um, We have um, the LGU representatives. Um, we actually have invited three, uh, sec uh, three uh, municipalities. No? And um, we would like to recognize those coming from Santa Barbara. Yes, sir. Okay. I think the two others are coming, or if you're here, uh, please uh, uh, raise your hand na lang. Okay, and we also have uh, um, from the private sector, the, the um, contractors from the private sectors or office of private practitioners. Okay, can you please raise your hand? Okay, so we have this group. And we also have from our fellow academic institution. Okay, so we have from the University of San Agustin representatives. And I see one who just came in, our alumnus uh, of this university. So welcome, sir. And of course, um, outside of engineering, we have invited the College of Agriculture, particularly the environmental science and agricultural engineering students. Can you please raise your hand? Okay. And we also have participants, of course, coming from the fifth year civil engineering students who took their time out of their OJT to be here. So please raise your hands. And uh, the bulk, the volume of this group is actually coming from the second year, civil engineering students. So I hope you get to realize what civil engineering is through this and you get to appreciate more your civil engineering course because of this seminar. Okay, let me go to the second part of my task today. And of course, I, I'd like to... Uh, uh, welcome them both, no? coming from a faraway place, <laughs> okay, just to, uh, um, this is actually like um, they, they wanted to visit CPU and we have an alumnus with this company and uh, we are fortunate that this uh, seminar is now being held as a product of such no? um, a trip. No? And let me first introduce our alumnus who works in the company. So we have, who will also speak later. Uh, we have uh, Jonan Castillon, sir. 
So for the past six years, Jonan has supported the director, our main speaker today, which is uh, Ross Woe, in the development and man managing the website of Woe Infrastructure Management and the InfraManage.com project, no? a contractor. His 10 years of online marketing experience and search engine optimization skills help improve the online presence of the company. So that's for um, Jonan. Okay, so our second speaker is Ross Woe. He is the founder of Woe Infrastructure Management. Um, is an asset management and system integration specialist. With over 30 years experience in municipal and local government infrastructure, asset management, and engineering. He has been consulting in infrastructure management for 20 years in the areas of transportation utilities, uh, transportation utilities, community facilities, and property. Ross has contributed to a number of New Zealand national data capture advisory and infrastructure standard setting projects. So I think, I believe, uh, um, Engineer Ross would uh, introduce himself more later. Okay, so without further ado, I will now give the floor to our uh, resource speaker this morning, to Engineer Ross Wool. Um, just to fill in a few more gaps about myself, um, I have been, initially I started working uh, in engineering construction and project management in uh, municipal government in New Zealand. So building roads, water supplies, uh, sewer systems, treatment plants, um, stormwater systems, all of those sorts of things. And I did that for 16 years and then I uh, had the opportunity to uh, start my own consulting firm at quite a young age. Um, I had ended up with some particular skills that were in demand in the marketplace and so for the last 21 years I've been consulting uh, in New Zealand. More recently um, we've been doing work outside of New Zealand as well. Uh, almost all of the New Zealand municipalities are clients of mine, not all the time, they call me in when they need specialist work done uh, within the infrastructure asset management arena. Um, more recently, we've been doing work for the New Zealand government uh, up in the Pacific Islands, uh, also in Australia and uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia this last year, uh, working for the World Bank. Um, and just yesterday, I was talking to my colleague that I collaborate with, uh, with the World Bank, and it seems that we're going to be doing some of this sort of work with the the government of the Philippines and the World Bank over the next 12 months or all two years. So um, that is going to be a real privilege having on this trip, my first trip to the Philippines. Uh, had a look at Manila and I've been down to Davao and now uh, Iloilo. Uh, there is um, lots of exciting potential uh, to help with here. Um, I also have, uh, through my skills, been and putting into um, various international manuals as well. Uh, and I have uh, some colleagues in the USA that I collaborate with. Uh, so I, I do <coughs> maintain a, an international perspective as well as my work in New Zealand. Um, I did manage to pick up a mild flu in, in uh, Manila, so I'll, you'll have to excuse if I cough. Um, as part of the work I've done, we and uh, Engineer Jonan has helped me with this over the last number of years, we have a number of um, websites. Uh, the War Infrastructure Management site is my consulting website. There is information there. I put a lot of information in my lectures and um, uh, teaching around the subject up on InfraManage. Um, and more recently, just in the last 12 months, we've um, launched this climate adaptation platform in conjunction with the University of Auckland, where we're collating a case study and useful information around climate adaptation practice uh, as it relates to infrastructure. And so uh, we've included, there is information on that site around the Philippines because I have um, Filipino staff and because we recognise that it was most likely that we would be working up here uh, sometime soon. Um, 
and, and additionally, the Philippines is quite vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So uh, we've put up some of the papers there. If you go search, um, there's a, that's quite well indexed for search. Now, um, I remember when I was a student and I would attend, attend a lecture like this, I might be making notes because there's, oh, I, I want to get the information off the slides. These slides will be made available to the Dean's Office after the lecture, so if you're wanting them, there's no information on here that's particularly copyrighted or anything like that. So if you're wanting to grab the slides or, or a particular slide for reference, um, please talk to the Dean's Office regarding that and they will make that available to you. Um, so, Philippines and New Zealand, uh, both island countries. We're, New Zealand, we're at the, the ends of the earth. We're down, down south. Uh, it's significantly colder in New Zealand in the south of uh, New Zealand in the winter than it is here. Um, in fact, it's the middle of our summer in New Zealand at the moment and it's a, about the same temperature as here. So that gives you a comparison. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting is our, our total land area isn't that much different between New Zealand and, and the Philippines. It's, it's reasonably close. Um, as you'll be able to see, we have a lot less islands than you do. So, um, so I decided to pull together a little bit of information here. And the first thing you'll notice um, about the Philippines versus New Zealand is that uh, there's a significant difference in the population. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in New Zealand, we like to think of ourselves as nice, friendly, loving people, but clearly we've got a lot to learn from the Philippines about being friendly and loving, given on the population. So, um, but the, the thing that's also happening is your population here in the Philippines is growing quite quickly. So the, the 145 million in 2050 um, is, is a figure I got from the UN statistics. Um, New Zealand, uh, only a million growth. And that's a lot of extra people in 30 years. We'll come back to that uh, in some further slides. Uh, obviously, the Philippines has 7,600 islands. New Zealand has two. Uh, Metro Manila has 24 million and Auckland too, but that's relative to the population again. Um, if Metro Manila only had 2 million people, uh, where would everybody else be? The, both countries are subject to a range of natural hazards, and if you look at the two lists there, the only one that's really different um, is I think the Philippines suffers more from landslides that, that would impact population centres. Um, our landslides in New Zealand tend to be in, the, in very rural areas and uh, away from population, so they don't. They might uh, maybe uh, damage a road, but we very, very rarely have landslides that um, damage housing. Um, and uh, we, whilst we have cyclones, are not at anywhere near the occurrence. A cyclone. So in the southern hemisphere, the the rotation is the other way for the storms. So. In the northern hemisphere, they're hurricanes or, or typhoons. In the southern hemisphere, they're called cyclones. Same sort of storm, they just go a, a different way, which is quite interesting. Um, so you have a lot more typhoons uh, in the Philippines, and we have occasional cyclones that cause us problems. Um, but, but the engineering for the, for the storm and the calamity type issues doesn't change particularly. Uh, and we've had some very large earthquakes in the last decade in New Zealand that have caused a lot of damage on structures. So um, the same, I was down in Davao earlier in the week in, uh, in a mall and you could see the, the cracks in the columns from the, the recent earthquakes that had quite a new mall. Um, so there's still uh, very similar issues around big earthquakes. Um, in terms of managing infrastructure going forward, uh, both countries have growth going on. Um, I think both countries would probably feel that the growth is rapid for, for their history at the moment, but uh, it's a matter of scale. The Philippines has obviously a lot more growth given the, the population, um, but also the growth in the economy as well. Um, one of the things when you start getting into the discipline of infrastructure management, and, and we'll unpack some of this today, is if you follow the news at all, you will hear all sorts of opinions and, and information. 
Um, when you're in a science-based profession like engineering or infrastructure management or planning, um, you've got to get below that noise and look at the look at true facts and true information because infrastructure is a very expensive um, hobby uh, for countries. You know, you can spend five, six, seven, ten percent of your GDP on infrastructure, and you have to base your decision making on facts, not on on opinions. Um, and so what the discipline teaches you to do is to look at facts. And I think um, as engineers or as technology uh, specialists, that's what we do. We don't, we don't have conspiracy theories and opinions. You, you take facts and you do, uh, you, know, you do analysis on that and then you can make decisions from that. Um, so in terms of um, our infrastructure, again, very, very well, the same issues. Uh, around the population and uh, growth of services, um, around the need for resilience from natural calamities and hazards, uh, and around the climate adaptation as, as we continue to get climate change. Um, the other thing, and, and it's a bit interesting to notice just even in Manila with the new skyways, you know, the, the, you build new assets. I, I was on the road in from the airport here um, yesterday. It's brand, you know, quite new, the, the big uh, multiple carriageway one. Uh, and last night we were in one of the new malls. You're always building new, um, new infrastructure and often at higher standards than old. So that creates an issue that has to be managed uh, by municipalities and governments. Um, and even even the construction, uh, the what's required changes over time. Um, and then one of the things that I, I've had a, a look around um, some of the the master plans and the comprehensive development plans over the last week. And one of the things that we we and I'll talk about this as we go through uh, the replacement and renewal of assets over time they wear out and. Uh, that is one of the disciplines of infrastructure management, uh, asset management. There's the, the Philippines documents at the moment are a little bit silent on that, um, but I'm sure it's something that you do uh, and that you will continue to do. Um, one of the really th interesting things when you look into a country from the outside um, is what you discover. This graph is, was done in, I think, 2016 by The Economist magazine. And back in 1950, um, if we come over here, the 12 largest countries in the world included Germany and Britain and Italy and France. And we tend to think of those as big, big economies and big countries. And, and yes, they still are. But by 2013, here's the Philippines. This is the population of the world. So here's the, uh, by country, here's the Philippines coming in at number 12. And um, the, the colour coding here is by continent. So the blue was Europe, uh, purples, United States, and, and, that, and then the, the brownie colours, Asia. Um, and so you've got China and India and Indonesia and Pakistan, Bangladesh, and the Philippines coming in. Now, when you come across here to the projected populations of 2050, notice that Europe's not there anymore. And um, that India and China are still at the top, obviously. The United States has only dropped one place. Nigeria will have more population than the United States by then. Philippines is number 10. A couple of things we can note from that. If you, there's lots of commentary in our news in New Zealand, and I'm sure there is in your news here in the Philippines, about America being weak and its economy's going to decline and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's finished. That would not suggest that that is the case. Um, America has, in the Western world, a number of, of huge advantages, and not the least of which is their Hispanic immigration, because what it means is that they've got quite a young population that's getting increasingly well-educated. Their economy has dips and troughs, and they've had one over the last decade, a, a dip, but fundamentally their population, the fact that they occupy an entire continent, and the fact that they have a reasonably young, by Western standards, population, and they are 25% of the world's economy, would suggest that whilst they're going to have rivalry with India and China, um, they're not going to fade. 
So um, they are going to continue to be a particularly dynamic and strong economy and, and have a strong influence in world affairs for some time to come. The thing that I find particularly interesting is the fact that the Philippines, by 2050, will be the 10th largest country in the world by population. What that means is that you're going to be building a lot of infrastructure. It also means that there is going to be a lot of investment in the Philippines economy over that period. Not only Filipino investment, but foreign investment, because there's huge opportunities that occur as a result of that population growth and also around the fact that you are going to be the 10th largest country in the world. If you, previously for us in New Zealand, we would have been thinking of Europe as you know, Germany and Italy and, and the UK and France as being big, important countries. They, their importance is declining. The importance of the Asian large countries, Indonesia, the Philippines, India and China is continuing to grow. And it's hard because you don't think of yourselves in those terms. What that also means for those, you young people in the room who are training to be engineers, it means that you have a lifetime career of magnificent opportunities because your country is going to have huge amounts of investment in infrastructure and other things. Uh, and, and that needs um, and buildings and housing for people and that means that they need engineers to do the designs and the, the project management and the, all of those things. The same with the, the construction companies that are in the room. You know, the, 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 there's a world of opportunities sitting in front of you uh, just by the sole fact of that population growth and also of the fact of where um, the Philippines sits in the world. Now it's hard because you've got Japan and China and others around you and you go, oh yes, they're much bigger countries. But, but you need to understand, I guess, that, that you are also getting to be quite a big and quite important country in your own right. So just, we'll, we'll put the Philippines to one side for a moment. Um, just a quick uh, lesson about New Zealand that those who don't know, um, so with these two islands, up, up the north there we have Auckland, which is our largest city, two million. Hamilton in the middle there, Tauranga are also big cities. Um, Palmas, uh, Wellington's our capital at the bottom end of the North Island, and then we have two big cities, uh, Christchurch and Dunedin, on the east coast of the South Island. Um, this is the South Island where Jonah and I live. We live in this little town here called Timaru. Um, we're about two hours drive south of, um, of Christchurch. The dominating feature of the South Island is what's called the Southern Alps, quite a large mountain range, which is there because of a... Um, large fault line there. Um, this is Timaru, uh, we have 29,000 population, we have a, a small but very efficient port, take a lot of uh, the South Island's container traffic goes through Timaru, have quite a nice beach there beside the port. Um, it would be lovely apart from the fact the water's quite cold. Um, so uh, whereas your water up here and the water at the top end of New Zealand is warm and nice to swim in that, has to be a very summer, sunny and warm day before you go swimming in the, in the beach at New Zealand, uh, at Timaru. Um, lots of green spaces and then we've got the mountains and the hills behind us there. Um, as I said, the defining feature of the South Island of New Zealand is the Alpine Fault. And um, they've studied it quite extensively. Um, and in the next, the, the, the scientific position at the moment is that within the next 50 years there is a 30% probability of a foresight earthquake off that fault. So they know the frequency that it moves and shifts and the size of them. Um, now a foresight earthquake is a big earthquake, uh, bearing in mind it's a, you know, it's a logarithmic scale, so each, each seven, eight is ten times bigger than seven is ten times bigger than and six. And um, a foresight earthquake will cause major and significant damage uh, throughout the South Island of New Zealand um, when it occurs. It's not a matter of if, it's just going to be a matter of when. Um, we're very, very clever in New Zealand because we managed to build our capital city on a major fault line as well. So there's a thing called the Wellington Fault. So that's the harbour um, 
the airport is just in that little narrow stretch of land between that island and then the main CBDs in that little loop of a bay there. The Wellington Fault runs right past it. That, that earthquake about a hundred and, uh, sorry, that fault a hundred and thirty years ago or forty years ago kicked up a, a Force 9 earthquake. So it is a fault that will generate Force 9 earthquakes um, and, and we've managed to build our, our capital city on that. Um, we're even cleverer than that because New Zealand has quite a number of volcanoes and each one of those volcanoes with a number beside it has a decent sized town or city on it. So uh, Christchurch and Dunedin, the two big cities in New Zealand, not only have the fault line up the middle but they're sitting on dormant volcanoes. Um, New Plymouth over number 11 there, that's got quite a major cone volcano beside it. Um, and then Auckland itself um, is built on a volcanic plateau and field that has over a hundred volcanoes. Um, the, the most recent ones, that big big red one there, it's called Rangatoto, that was 600 years ago was that eruption. So the, the last eruption on the Auckland volcanic field um, was 600 years ago, but it's not a dead field. They, they think that, the, that it's moving north, but that's all, you know, volcanoes can do what they like to some extent. So. Um, so all of our major uh, cities and towns in New Zealand are either on a decent sized fault line or a decent site next to a decent sized volcano. Which means that we've had to think about calamity and think about the issues associated with that as part of our engineering practice. Um, in terms of New Zealand, we, the European settlement, obviously here in the Philippines, you had the Spanish coming in the 1500s, but um, New Zealand was a lot more recent than that. Um, and the, the reason I've given you those dates of infrastructure development is the different phases of development use different materials and different techniques, but you also use that once you've worked out when infrastructure was constructed as when you might need be needing to replace it. Um, <coughs> And at the moment, the, the stuff that a lot of the materials that went in in that post-World War II period for us, uh, 1946 through to perhaps uh, 19, mid-1960s, uh, is coming up for replacement, um, particularly the water pipes. We used a lot of um, asbestos cement water pipe that, that was the wonder material of the 1950s, but hasn't, hasn't lasted. Uh, we're getting between 60 and 80 years out of pipes and so a lot of them are coming up now for major replacement. Um, replacing our assets is more expensive and difficult than um, building brand new ones in a, in a brand new cleared site. Um, the phase uh, during that period, 84 to 94, we had a major recession. I've got the next slide, I'll show you that. Uh, we started our infrastructure management practice in New Zealand in 1996. Um, <clears throat> that 1995 to 2020 period, we've built a lot of major water treatment and wastewater treatment, sewer treatment plants. Um, and our next phase from, from this year onwards will be around building infrastructure for population growth and infrastructure renewals. So we're, we're going to be busy for quite some time to come in New Zealand. Um, this graph here shows uh, the impact of recessions on infrastructure. So. The blue line is, um, and this was our, our Office of the Auditor General who, who look after oversee all public finance expenditure in New Zealand. Um, and the blue line is, is the uh, capital expenditure. So you can see it was rising up through the 1970s to the early 1980s. And then you get this big drop off here in 86, 87 when our big recession hit. We had over 10% of our population was unemployed in that period, including professionals, engineers, accountants, lawyers. It's a very big recession. Um, what happened during that period is we, we just, the country ran out of money, which countries sometimes do. Um, and so the capital expenditure actually dropped below the level of replacement. Um, so we were consuming our assets, essentially. That's the grey line. Um, and so for a period of nearly a decade, New Zealand didn't build very much. We've still got problems in our economy and our infrastructure as a result of that period. Um, the more recent GFC recession, which you can see up here, was less severe for us, much shorter, and we were miles away from consuming 
assets. And so at the end of that period uh, of that big recession in New Zealand, our Auditor General said to the New Zealand um, local government units and to the provincial, regional governments and to the, the national government, um, hey, you guys could be in a lot of trouble. You could, have, you could be bankrupt and you don't know it because your assets could be in such poor shape that you can't afford to fix them. We need to know what's going on. And that started the infrastructure asset management in New Zealand. So this practice that we've been doing for the last 24, 25 years did not come because we are clever or we're smarter than anybody else or anything like that. It came because we had a major problem in our economy that we started clawing our way out of. And of course, when you have no money, you've got to use your head to try and think your way and work your way out of, out of the problems. And so that's what we started doing with the infrastructure asset management. Um, and it's often the way with engineering practice. There'll be something doesn't work very well and then you learn the lessons from that and apply it and you end up with much better practice. So um, that's what kicked us off in the infrastructure asset management in New Zealand. Now, since that time, we've had a, we have a thing in Australia and New Zealand called the infrastructure uh, International Infrastructure Management Manual. We've also had cooperation from Canada, the South Africa and the US on this manual. Um, and since then also there's been an international standards organisation, ISO 55000, which is a, uh, a, that was in 2014. Uh, so that has been um, a standard around asset management. And they have these definitions and I thought uh, it would be useful just to give you the two definitions of infrastructure asset management. So it's management, financial, economic, technical and other as, uh, practices applied to physical assets uh, with the object, objective of providing a required level of service in the most cost effective manner. Now, one key point in that is it's not necessarily the cheapest manner. It is the most cost effective. Sometimes it's better to spend some more money early to save a lot of money later on. There's a staying in our transportation that good roads cost less. So if you maintain your roads at a good standard rather than letting them completely break, it costs you less than letting roads completely break and then having to rebuild them. So it's that sort of uh, thinking. Um, what you're trying to do, and we'll talk about this a bit more in the next few slides, is manage the whole life cycle of the, of the asset in the most cost effective way. So ISO 55000 is a little bit of a wider definition and it can be applied to IT assets and to organisational um, facilities and things like that as well. Uh, so it's a coordinated activity uh, to realise value from assets uh, which can be an item, thing or entity. Um, and so the ISOs, as ISOs often are, um, has a broader definition. The, the ISO 55000, if you're aware of ISO 9000, which is the quality one, or ISO 14000, which is the environmental one, they are ISO management standards and they're written in a particular format and way. ISO 55000 is also an ISO management standard, so it's in that same sort of format as 9000 and 14000. The, the thing about infrastructure asset management, this was hard for me. I trained as a civil engineer. And, I, and the, the thing about infrastructure asset management is you need to do planning and you need to know about accounting and finance and you need to know about economics, so you know, need to know about delivering customer services. So it's a wider, it's a combination of a number of disciplines. In New Zealand, a lot of people who are engaged as uh, consultants or in local government units as um, infrastructure asset managers do have engineering backgrounds, but there's a broader skill set that has to be uh, teamed together. And I think one of the real advantages of the practice and the discipline is it's forced us to talk to the other disciplines and learn from them and the combination has actually been um, better, the whole has been better than the individual disciplines. Um, over the last 20 years I, I just uh, raided our bookshelf one day and threw everything on a table and said this is all the manuals. There, there are now many, many resources available, uh, a lot of them are available online as well. 
uh, physical manuals for different countries and things like that. So there's a, there's a uh, it's not it's it's maturing as a discipline uh, and as a field of uh, study. Um, there are num numerous practice and field guides. There are numerous international standards and and guidelines um, around either specific aspects, maybe a condition rating or evaluation uh, or um, contract or other standards, um, but also around the overall management. So th these things are available. Um, this diagram here is quite complex, but it's out of Annex B of ISO 55000. I really just wanted to talk to you about how it fits together. Don't worry too much about the individual boxes. So. At the top, you have an organisation or an entity. Now, that might be the public highways department or a, a local government unit or a, a public uh, utilities department or something like that. So it can be at a whole-of-government level entity or it could be a more local entity. Um, below that, the second line, you, the, the thinking is that you set up a policy that says this is what we're trying to do. Uh, and that you'll have a strategic asset management plan, uh, a short 30, 40 page document that says these are our overall objectives. And that strategic plan might look out 10, 20, 30 years and say, this is with the drivers that we've got, this is what we're trying to achieve. <coughs> Below that you have a, uh, individual asset management plans, often for a road or a water utility or a, a sewer network. Uh, and you also have how to implement that, how you will have software systems and planning systems around that and uh, and then at the bottom performance evaluation and back it goes around the loop. So the thing is that the, the practice starts at the organisation, comes down to a policy and a high level document and then comes down to more specific documents. Another way of looking at it, and this is still out of the ISO, is that it, it has a lot of individual components, but essentially you have the things that define your asset management, so that's your policy, the services that you're trying to provide, uh, the demands that you have for those services, uh, the, the infrastructure inventory that you currently have in place, uh, the condition of that in, uh, inventory, and the risks that you're managing. So that's your definers. Then you come into managing the life cycle of each of individual uh, assets or buildings. Uh, so that's your life cycle st strategies. And then you have your enablers, which are your planning items and your uh, people resources and uh, your software systems, your quality management systems and those sort of things. So, um, and that just is a cycle that goes on, but the definers, the life cycle strategies and the enablers is a good way of thinking of the, the three things. <coughs> Infrastructure asset management also occurs at three levels. So at the top, there's the strategic level. Um, the work that I'm going to be doing with the World Bank here in the Philippines over this next year will be at that sort of level where you're talking at 15 to 30 year strategies based on big picture demands and big picture uh, issues that you have to deal with, climate change being one of those. The, the tactical level stuff is the one to 10 year stuff or even out to 15 year plans, but it's more detailed planning based on the strategies. And then your operational is, is the one year. So hey, what are we going to build this year? Um, and, and are we getting the sequencing of the building of infrastructure right based on the 10 to 15 year plans or the, or the 30 year plans? Um, when, you, when you apply it across those three levels and, and keep that clear in your mind, it helps with that. Um, what what is also helps is when you move into an infrastructure asset management planning framework, um, the justification of expenditure, of major expenditure, is uh, often better accepted because you have uh, a, a very coherent planning framework that you're, you're putting projects into and, and uh, testing them against uh, uh, the requirements of the municipality or the province or the, or the overall government. <coughs> this diagram here um, is, is my own. Um, with all of those books and manuals that we had, it was getting very complex and I thought people were losing uh, sight of, of actually how simple infrastructure asset management is. So 
I, I took a leaf out of um, Albert Einstein's book. He had a, a dictum that said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And it's a very good test for an engineer. Um, how do you make something as simple as possible, but what does not simpler mean? And it's, uh, it's a good one. So I, I took all the asset management information and manuals and said, right, if I could make it as simple as possible, but not simpler, what would I do? I came up with this diagram. So underpinning infrastructure asset management completely is this asset inventory or asset register, depending on what part of the world you're in as to what you call it. And it's a, it's a catalogue or a, a list or a, a database of all of the assets that you own and you're managing. What they are, what their physical characteristics are, when they were built, what materials they are, what condition they're in, and how are they performing? Are they delivering the service that you want them to deliver? In New Zealand, we often use our contractors now to collect that information for us and update it on a, on a basis, because they're out there all the time doing the work. Um, so you can't, you need, you can actually do infrastructure asset management without that, but you're making a lot of guesses. Um, so, so that becomes an, a, an early work, is to just understand what you've got. And you go, oh yeah, of course, we know what we've got, we know we've got this road, but what are the drains off that road, and what are the lights, and where are the cables, and, and just for a road, and, and how thick's the concrete, or the um, asphalt concrete, and it, has it got steel in it, and, uh, and on it goes. So, um, and is, is the road big enough for the amount of traffic on it? Is, does it have a decent capacity, uh, or is it getting congested the whole time? And, that's, that's around the performance. So once you've got an inventory or, or even a high-level view of um, what you've got, then you can start... The, the centre of asset management is life cycle management, but to do life cycle management, you ha over on this side, you have to understand what services you're providing or trying to provide, what the demand for those services are, and, and population growth is a, is a big part of that, and the risks you're managing. So to talk just for a moment about climate change and climate adaptation, you could put it in the risk management box. I think where we're going to end up is we're going to end up with another box that's called sustainability or climate adaptation that will be one on its own because it's such an issue. Um, but at the moment, this reflects what the, the manuals and the things... Once you understand all of that, and you understand the assets that you own, you can go, well, what do I need to operate those? What do I need to do to maintain them? What do I need to replace? What new assets do I need to do, build to, to meet the demands or the services that I'm providing? And what assets do I need to dispose of? So maybe you've got a big facility that's at the end of this life, you might have to knock it over. And, or a road that you completely rip up and, and build a new one. Uh, and then you can run optimization against that. <clears throat> you get over here. When I started my engineering career, I knew nothing about revenue, because that was the accountant's problem. I knew about spending money, because I was really good at that. I was building stuff. And so I would go, oh, yeah, expenditure. I, I have some operations, some maintenance expenditure. I have some replacement, um, some capital in New Zealand. We have to account for depreciation as well. But there's another side to that, which engineers often don't think about, is somebody has to pay for that. So am I getting fees, charges, tariffs, loans, uh, government grants or funding or, or transfers? Or in the US, they raise bonds. The municipalities have bonds, so they're borrowing money in a bond. Uh, and, and so every piece of expenditure has to be paid for somehow. And, and often there's multiple different ways of paying for things. So. Um, when you start uh, looking at, at managing your assets this way, the, first, the, the next thing you find out is that what you're trying to do and what you've actually got, there's gaps on every single... You, you didn't understand your risks well, um, you hadn't thought so much about the growth or growth in particular areas, uh, and, you, and the service levels, uh, the services you try and provide, there's more community expectation of higher services. Um, so you can you do another loop and you look at building those gaps into the life cycle management. The other thing you find out pretty quickly is that you get across to the money you need to spend and somebody will say, well, we haven't got enough money, can't afford it, what are we going to do? 
And that starts another conversation because I'm sure it's not like this in the Philippines, but in New Zealand, our politicians would then say to the engineers, oh, just make it work. If we give you this much money, make it work. And engineers, we, we would try and do that. But sometimes if you're multiple hundreds of millions of dollars or pesos short, you can't make it work. And so what you've got to do is go back and say, well, hang on, if, if that's definitely only the money we got, what's changing? Are we, are we going to drop the services that we're providing? Or are we going to, is the growth actually not going to happen? Or more likely, we're going to take more risks. So maybe we're going to run a, a bridge to failure or a, um, a water pipe to failure or, or something like that. And so then, and it happens all over the world. Suddenly you see this bridge collapses and you go, now why did, why did that bridge collapse? <coughs> it's not because as engineers we don't know how to maintain bridges and fix them up and strengthen them. We do. But there'll be some no money there and somebody said, oh, just, just, it'll, it'll be okay, just let it keep it going. Yeah, oh, we should really be spending some money on that bridge. Oh, no, no, we haven't got the money. And then the bridge drops into the river or, or whatever, and you go, oh, now we have to spend the money, you know. But it's not a very, that's the, the, that's the wrong way to manage assets because that gets very costly at that point. So this process is around in, enabling the conversations between the engineers and the funders and the politicians about what actually needs to be done going forward. That's part one. We've got another lecture coming up. We're going to have a break, but I'm very happy to take any questions and skip back through the slides if there's questions on a particular slide at this point. So. Okay, so that's uh, part one. Any question from the floor? Please identify yourself, sir, and uh, <laughs> throw your question. Hi, Joel Sumushera, Office of the President, Central Philippine University. Uh, sir, there is this uh, city ordinance or this uh, national law that uh, we have to declare some of the buildings as historical buildings, heritage sites. Yeah. And some of these structures would uh, age uh, as long as 250 years, 150 years, or 100 years. Yep. Uh, how do we approach uh, the safety of that uh, building? Because uh, we cannot uh, touch it or improve it uh, when they declare it as a right. heritage site. So we have similar problems throughout the world uh, with heritage buildings. Um, and the first question, you can do a, a heritage building plan. So you can do a specific plan for a specific building because they're not a general asset. They have their own peculiarities. Um, that has been happening in the US and up in the, um, the UK and, and Europe uh, where they will do a specific plan. Um, in some cases, they're doing a complete structural frame analysis model of the buildings and then working out whether they can retrofit without, um, without damaging the historic fabric uh, if, the, if they need earthquake strengthening or something like that. Um, the, the question, the first question that you also have to answer is, is, is the building going to be open and in use um, or, or is it not? So for argument's sake, uh, if you, I was in Italy uh, two years ago, and they have some very, very historic buildings. So if we took the Colosseum, for argument's sake, it is still open for use. They've had to put a, uh, they've put a, a curtain wall to tie it back to because it, it was just about to fall over. So um, when in the Colosseum's case, they've tied the old concrete building back to a, an external structure. Um, if you look at the um, Notre Dame in Paris, with the fire, they're going to have to work out how do they retain the existing structure and still you know, strengthen it and replace what's been lost to the fire at the same time. So it, it's possible to do those things. Within this discipline, you would just be creating a specific plan for that specific asset. Uh, the thing with very historic buildings is they are extremely expensive to maintain. 
Uh, and so there's always that question, to what level do you maintain them to? Are they maintained for everybody access for the historic or, or are they are we just going to maintain it so people can look at it from outside uh, so it's those sorts of things I would like to add something to that because I, I um, there was once a um, involvement of the civil engineering department in the assessment of the heritage buildings in Iloilo City so at <clears throat> It was around 2015, and that is where I get to know that we have actually a uh, Iloilo City uh, uh, Cultural Heritage uh, Council. So they are the ones um, like looking over these structures. So in terms of the buildings, um, because the ones which we studied, the Civil Engineering Department in collaboration with uh, De La Salle University in Manila. So we were able to do the three types of assessment for uh, the heritage buildings in the city proper, the Calle Real uh, region. So um, our students were able to uh, do the wind risk assessment, the seismic risk assessment, and then the fire risk assessment for those buildings. Um, as far as I know, so these buildings are having what we call the adaptive reuse. So because it's being used as a commercial area, so it's, uh, it's somewhat maintained in a way, structurally, and so that it's gonna be safe. But for other structures, so uh, like houses, uh, solely used for houses or even the, our churches. So I really don't have knowledge on that, but uh, what I believe would be uh, uh, no, uh, appropriate na authority to talk about that is the Iloilo City uh, Cultural Heritage uh, Council of Iloilo City. So they are the ones doing, uh, they're actually a group also of architects and engineers in, in that uh, council. But with regards to the structural soundness of those buildings, because they're already very old, uh, do you introduce uh, reinforcement uh, as long as uh, it will not compromise uh, the historical design? Um, as far as I know, they, we, we, the, the council welcomes the technologies uh, of like retrofitting the building so that it would still be uh, structurally safe. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing I found quite interesting walking around the Colosseum in, in Rome, and you know, it's a, an iconic historic building. If you think Rome, you think the Vatican and the Colosseum, is they had to make a decision. Were they going to put a, a, a tieback structure that they, they made dark grey so it, didn't, it wasn't intrusive and retain the structure, or were they going to lose the structure? And um, with but in, in Christchurch in particular, our big cathedrals there all got massive damage with the earthquake because um, churches, you know, they're high and they're narrow and, and they're not, they don't, you get a big earthquake, they don't, they don't handle it very well. So the sort of, the decision making at a high level is, are we going to lose that structure or are we going to adapt it but we lose some of the character or some of the historical authenticity? Um, and that's, that's a hard decision, but if you get on the wrong side of it, you will lose the structure. Uh, so it's that, and, I, and you know, with, with something as iconic as the Colosseum, I was quite interested that they'd chosen to, to retain the structure, but they'd built a modern structure almost inside it in, in some places. So yeah, it was, it's an answer. Yeah, and I also forgot to mention that the output of those researches, like in the seismic uh, risk assessment group, they have uh, identified two high risks. So the buildings are being uh, assessed whether it's low risk uh, in terms of the seismic uh, risk, uh, medium risk, or uh, high risk. Yeah. So at that time, two buildings were identified. But uh, of course, <coughs> this, wa this was reported to the... Uh, City Heritage Council, and um, hopefully they became aware that it is uh, those two buildings are know. And of course, yeah, the retrofitting technologies and uh, no, and repairs have been uh, done with those buildings. In New Zealand, following the Christchurch earthquake, we had two buildings collapse, and 200 people died in collapsed buildings. So there was a big. Uh, we had our highest level of inquiry. Um, that we can have in New Zealand. 
And, and out of that, our earthquake building design standards changed. And every single public building and big private buildings in New Zealand now have to have a, structural a new structural assessment to the new standard. And within a certain period of time, they've got to have any retrofitting done. And so in terms of the, the, the local government unit um, asset plans for buildings in New Zealand, they've all now got to have a table that says we've done the earthquake assessment, this is what we found, this is the work that we have to do, this is the cost of it, and, and this is how long we, you know, and they're having to raise the, the tariffs and the fees that they're charging uh, to cover the cost of that work. So. Um, those are the sorts of things that happen because uh, when you get new understanding about earthquake impact, the previous standards were seen to be not adequate in New Zealand. And we had quite high standards, but nothing like a really big earthquake to test your, uh, your building standards out. So. Okay, so yes sir, and another question from the body. Good morning, Ross, good morning. I think. Uh, first thing, thank you for making additional islands for the Philippines. <laughs> As I understand, we only have but 7,107. You made it 7,641. <laughs> that, that was Wikipedia, so yeah, maybe Wikipedia needs fixing. So. Nonetheless, uh, by the way, I'm Vince. I'm from Santa Barbara. I'm the uh, Municipal Planning and Development uh, Coordinator. And being a Centralian, I would like still to express that all of you are still welcome to come to my office and ask for data. It's been since 2010 that I've been assisting uh, engineering students who conduct their uh, studies. So thank you for those students that had made uh, uh, studies on our uh, uh, slaughterhouse. They made a hefty uh, good study on that one. So we'll be using it. But then, Ross, this is my concern and my interest as well. Since I'm with the local government unit, we're talking about municipalities, and you've made uh, emphasis on your uh, 27 years as consultant until now. Uh, do I get it or do I understand that when we talk about municipalities, is it also similar in our case that you get to be a consultant? Uh, I'm more focused on infrastructure asset management. You were talking more about discipline. You were talking more about policies. Now, in our case, when we do uh, infrastructure projects, the focus is more on the existing laws, the hard laws. So with the local government unit, we use the local government code, and it's quite restrictive. Uh, the emphasis on discipline and policy application is quite limited. Yeah. It restricts us. So the next series of lectures, um, Jonan is going yeah. to talk us yeah. through that. Uh, but I'd like to hear from your case, if how do you go about, or how do the people in New Zealand approach infrastructure management or, or, or uh, say, uh, influence? Yeah. So, so in New Zealand, following that big recession, our local government act, the local government unit law, uh, changed and required um, every local government to do infrastructure asset management. So to be able to prove to their citizens that, and to the government that they were spending their money prudently and well in the long term. And um, our local governments prior to that Maybe the politicians didn't want, they wanted to build a big sparkly new stadium, didn't want to fix the road, or didn't want to fix the water pipe. Uh, I'm sure that never happens here, but it was happening in New Zealand. And so they were hiding the defects. And, the, and, and so what the infrastructure asset management did was brought everything out into the light. Uh, so there was a legal, there's been a legal requirement to do that since 1996. Also, the government grants and the government um, co-payments, if you don't have these plans in place, you don't get them. So, good, so it's good. tied to the funding as well. So it's a, it's a planning mechanism around making sure money is spent wisely, uh, also around making sure the government's investing wisely. 
we still, the, the local governments still have to build lots of projects and, and that's a different part of it. But this is around the forward planning and the, the government co-investment. So. All right, it's more about the political system plus the administrative uh, yeah. aspect. Yeah, but, yeah, but the, next, the next set of yep. slides, Joe, is going to we'll show how that fits past. together. Yeah. Oh, thank you, sir. Any more questions from the buddy? It's one, one over so, here. One behind you. Yeah. <coughs> okay, ma'am. Yes, thank you once again for the uh, lecture today. I'm interested about, uh, um, because there could be many structures that have specifications. One specific interest, for example, is bridges. They are designed to handle specific tonnage. Yeah. And um, I wonder how you, be, because if, as, as we know, when this tonnage is uh, exceeded, it uh, shortens the life of the bridge. So I wonder how this is handled in New Zealand. Because we're al we already see that, for example, in the Philippines, uh, there's not, uh, I mean, uh, th there's not much visible control and on uh, cargo that goes through the bridges. So I wonder how you handle this I, at your end. I have Thank a very you. good example of that because um, I went to a presentation that won, a, won an award um, about uh, nearly a year ago. We have this one bridge in New Zealand that's uh, on our way to Christchurch, um, which is a kilometre long. It's the longest bridge in New Zealand. Um, mile long, sorry, 1.6 kilometres. Uh, when we were children, we would hold our breath at the start of the bridge and see if we could hold our breath to the to the end of it. It's, it's a, you did go blue in the face because you're trying to hold your breath across the bridge. That bridge is getting quite old now, and the, the tonnages have, have crept up. So the government has done a whole lot of studies, the government highways uh, on the bridge, and they know they're trying to extend the life because it will be a hugely expensive bridge to replace. So what they have done is they've put a, um, a tonnage um, way bridge automatic one on the bridge and they've said to all the truck drivers with cameras, if you take a truck across this bridge at high speed and high tonnage, you get hundreds of thousands of pesos fines, uh, equivalent, you know, it's really expensive. So they put it in and, and for the first few months they warned everyone, they said you're going you're too fast, too heavy. Uh, and then they said, once they'd warned everybody, they said, right, from now on, if you go across this bridge um, with a truck that's too heavy and, and, and uh, too fast, you, you will get this fine. And they're taking the photos and they can send the fine. Now, <clears throat> every now and again, you do have a very large tonnage load has to go across that bridge. It's, it splits the South Island. But you can do that with uh, a load permit and with closing the bridge and with going very, very slowly across and with multiple axles and things like that. So they do that occasionally when they have to. Um, but it's around enforcement controls. Interesting, um, about a decade ago I was up in Kunming and they'd built a new flyway, no tonnage control, and this thing was already cracking five years later. So they were actually closing it because the, the, the tonnage is on... Uh, on it had been too heavy and it had broken this brand new bridge. So it's an issue, but, but it's around enforcement. Um, you can, otherwise you're going to build bridges that are 10 times bigger than they need to be to handle uh, overload. And uh, there, must, there must be some restrictions and the tonnage that coming from other countries. Well, we, we don't, we're an island, so we don't have uh, the, the yes, uh, Big tonnage uh, stuff comes into the ports, but again, you can we have these uh, designated high tonnage routes that people can use. I see. Yeah. So. I see. So there's a different uh, route really for the ones that have high tonnage. Yeah, yeah. Yes. We have a, a specific. You have uh, each local government unit has to publish the routes through their area, and um, if again, if the, the high tonnage trucks are off those routes, they get very very high fines. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A good question because 
the Philippines is made of a lot of islands, so we have a lot of bridges, really. Uh -huh. So uh, we have kind of a mixed-use uh, bridge. No? So thank you, sir. Any more question? Yes. Sir, I would like to pick up uh, with that uh, topic on bridges. Uh, I understand that uh, there is uh, our uh, magnitude of uh, forest fire in As in Australia. Australia. Yeah. And uh, because of that vastness of uh, the coverage of the fire, maybe some of the horizontal structures like bridges have been affected. Yeah. So what is... Uh, uh, our approach with that as regards so to infrastructure management. In New Zealand, we're a lot like the Philippines. We're a lot wetter, a lot more rain, so we don't quite have the problem with fires. But in rural New South Wales, where a lot of the fires are, they have a lot of timber bridges. So if you've got a bridge with timber beams and a timber deck and you've got a fire go through, you're going to have problems. Um, so in that case, after the fire's finished and they finished fighting it, they would go and inspect um, the bridges, uh, do an initial visual inspection just to see if there's any sign of any damage. If there is, you would mark on an, uh, an emergency plan that the bridge has been damaged. Um, then you would come, maybe you would close that bridge uh, until you had a chance to do a full structural inspection. Um, and sometimes you might have to replace the bridge. Uh, in, in both Australia and New Zealand in our rural areas, we have lots and lots of old timber bridges, 100 years old. Hardwood timbers, they, 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 but they don't, hold, they don't carry the high tonnages. They're not strong enough for that. So they, they have a weight restriction on them, but they, they certainly don't. Um, if there's a fire, then that's a big risk to those bridges. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from the floor from the University of San Agustin. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Jesus Anayas. I'm a uh, assistant professor in uh, the College of Technology. Uh, this is more an observation in the Philippines. Uh, I've been away for the Philippines for 40 years. Uh, I work in the United States of America. The observation that I have here is that we lack enforcement. We are destroying our roads. We are destroying our bridges because of overloading. And the government would only do some uh, weighing of these trucks when there is some uh, comments in the, in the radio and said, oh, you have to do the weighing of your trucks. But the other problem is that uh, DPWH will tell you that, oh, we don't have equipment to have the weighing station, or they have a portable weighing station. We need enforcement of all of this in order for us to save money because every time that we have overloading, especially hauling of uh, uh, materials coming from the interior where they have uh, brought in all the uh, landfill, landfill materials to the city. <coughs> but um, our, our uh, roads, which was only constructed what, three years, five years ago, is now breaking up. So uh, I think uh, we need uh, uh, really enforcement from our government in order for us to, uh, to save our roads and our bridges. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just as a follow-up from that, uh, Timaru, where I used to work, I was... Um, the, the wastewater or the sewerage uh, engineer for 10 years. And we had very old pipes, which is why I got good at doing what I'm doing, because they were all coming up for repair. And we, we were pulling cameras through the pipes, and we were finding that many of them were broken. And we couldn't work out the pattern for the brokenness. And then 
what we worked out was where the very badly damaged pipes were was the old, not the current, but the old heavy traffic route that the big stock trucks and the big trucks in the country were going on because the, the load from the trucks, because they were overloaded in the 1960s and 70s, was transferring down in the trenches onto the pipes and breaking the pipes. So when you have very ba badly overloaded trucks, it's not just the road that it damages, it'll damage pipes underneath them as well. Um, sometimes one and a half metres deep, you're still getting damaged pipes off, off overloaded traffic. So we picked up this pattern and we're like, okay, what do we do about that? So then we went back to the old maps and we said, oh, oh, right, this is where all the old heavy traffic used to go. Let's look at all those pipes. Sure enough, they were all broken, needed replacing. Um, but it was a real, a real um, confirmation that heavy, heavy overloading on roads causes damage to more than just the road. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so that's uh, um, a valid uh, observation, sir. And uh, any more question? Yes, sir. Uh, I am uh, Reginaldo Talagire. I am a teacher at the University of San Agustin. I am a chemical engineer. Uh, I have a uh, environmental engineering class uh, in uh, USA. Uh, you discussed earlier that uh, you have many volcanoes in uh, New Zealand. And uh, so that means that uh, you have a lot of earthquakes. Uh, so uh, I would like to know, how do you uh, manage your buildings so that uh, it can resist uh, earthquakes uh, for uh, a long term? Right, um, so we, the, the big earthquake we had uh, seven or eight years ago in Christchurch caused a lot of damage to old buildings <coughs> in the Christchurch central. So Christchurch is a city of 350,000 people. In the central business district, they had to demolish more than 700 buildings that were damaged and unsafe to go back into. So the first two or three years after the earthquake, all they were doing was demolishing damaged buildings. Um, we have at the University of Canterbury, which is Canterbury's the province, uh, there is now an earthquake research centre that is doing a lot of uh, fundamental research into building um, survivability against earthquakes. So they're looking at columns, they're looking at structures, they're looking at jointing, they're looking at uh, glass um, popping and, and the resistance of building glass. Uh, they're looking at foundations. We had a lot of that got broken as well. Um, and that's leading, the, the research is leading straight back into increases in building standards. Um, so, so easy when you're rebuilding a new building because you can apply the new standard. Where it gets very technically quite difficult is when you've got an existing building and you have to retrofit the standards. And that's an individual building by the building design process. Uh, and sometimes when they've gone and said, oh, it's just, we can't retrofit, it's, the building's actually not safe, even though it survived the earthquake, knock it over, build a new building. Um, so that's the process that's been going on. Uh, you mentioned a research which is uh, conducted in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, what company is undergoing the research? So what? Uh, what company uh, is undergoing oh, so the research? So the government's funding and the university's funding and then industry, uh, the, the municipality is funding and also they have a, they've now got what they call the quake centre there. I'm actually doing some work for them at the moment, but they have industry co-funding coming in as well. So there's, there's everybody, when you have a massive earthquake, everybody understands the problem. So, so the funding follows. Um, uh, yep. And uh, who are the researchers? Uh, so researchers are faculty at the university. Um, they've all ha also had specialist visiting faculty from the United States and from UK, uh, and then faculty from other universities in New Zealand as well. Um, so, so it's been quite an international effort um, to to do that research. Um, but it's it, a lot of it's online. I mean, you can go into the University of Canterbury, and they've got the Quake Centre and the, all the projects are listed there, and, and I think a lot of the research is accessible, so. Now we are taking interest in uh, researches. 
Okay, um, any more questions from the body? We still have uh, part two, and maybe you, you can uh, reserve your questions for part two.